tell us your name and what your religious views are and what you do. Okay. I'm, I'm Richard Dawkins. Uh, I was the first Charles Simone Professor of the Public Understanding of Science at Oxford. And I write books and run the Richard Dawkins Foundation for Reason and Science, both the British and American versions of that. Oh, very good. And then what are you here for uh, these, these few weeks, uh, the Reason Rally and the Rock Band Belief? How did you come involved with these? Well, I'm on my way to Australia, as a matter of fact, to the Big Atheist Convention in Melbourne. And I'm going in, in a westerly direction and spending a lot of time, actually more time in the United States than in, than in Australia, uh, and doing various things. The Reason Rally was a high spot. Um, the Fort Bragg event is going to be another high spot. And there are various other fairly high spots uh, in between. And uh, I'm having a good time and enjoying it very much. Now, how did you find out about uh, the situation in Fort Bragg? Now, Justin uh, Griffith says that really that would never have happened without your help. And uh, how, how did you find out about it and get involved? I found out about the Fort Bragg event uh, actually last year when it was going to happen. And I was invited to speak there and I agreed. And I was very pleased to agree. It sounded like an excellent thing to do. And then it got cancelled. Uh, for reasons w which were obscure and complicated and which y you probably know better than I do. Um, and so when it was revived again this year, I was, um, again, very pleased to, to accept. I'm, I met Justin and, 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 and I admire him very much for what he's doing. Without Richard Dawkins, we couldn't tell this story. We couldn't get the story out. We certainly couldn't tell it honestly. I mean, it was, it was beautiful what he did, lending us his celebrity. And, and it wasn't just because, you know, we contacted him and hey, support the troops. Because he cared. He really cared. He cared in a big way. Two years in a row. And why are things like this important, the Reason Rally and Rock Beyond Belief? They're important because of the widespread uh, perception that the United States is a very, very religious country. Maybe it is a very, very religious country, but it's not as religious as I think many people think it is. And I suspect that there's an enormous um, well, if not majority, certainly a very large number of people who are not religious, but who are thought to be religious because it's kind of the, no, the, the done thing to be religious. And so the Reason Rally, I think, was very important to allow people to come together and recognize that they're not alone, which is a thing I notice very much when I'm giving talks, especially in the so-called Bible Belt. And I get very large audiences, very enthusiastic audiences, and they cheer and give a standing ovation very often. But I suspect the standing ovation is not so much for me as for each other, because they, they suddenly recognize that, they, that they're not alone. And the reason rally was, was that raised to a higher level. And instead of getting, say, 2,000, which is what I typically get when I give a lecture in the Bible Belt, um, it, was, it was, what, between 15, 000, 20,000? I don't know what the final it was, estimate was. Their final was. estimate was 20,000. 20,000, yeah. well, and that's in the rain. So that's very, very impressive and very inspiring. And Fort Bragg, well, that, that remains to be seen, but I, I think it's a very important thing to do, to go and, and um, show solidarity with the military uh, and show that, they, that whatever the senior officers may say, um, they don't, they're, they're serving their country. They're not serving God. They're serving the United States of America. I was just on a Navajo reservation um, the week before I came out to the Reason Rally painting uh, 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 Indians. My wife and I are painters. And um, when I came back, it was fascinating. Some of my friends said, well, you know, the Navajo, they track, they sense uh, energy through their hair. And if you cut their hair off, they can't track animals anymore. And when I explained to them how uh, the Navajo, and we've been to Africa and all over the world, how people really track, you know, they, they, the signs they see, and they can tell what time it was because maybe the shadow of a tree was here, so the animal went to this side. They were so disappointed. Um, and to me, it was so much more exciting, the mental magic, that these people are almost acting as scientists and figuring it out. And they said, well, I just think that would be so disappointing if that's oh. the way things are. Yes. Um, well, I, I'm on your side, needless to say. Uh, although I do think it's interesting uh, that it, if it's possible that the Navajo trackers themselves believe that it comes in through their hair. Well, they explain to me exactly yeah. what they're seeing. They're very aware. Oh, they, they, they know what they're, what Absolutely. they're doing. Absolutely. Yeah. But e even if they didn't, it wouldn't be, it wouldn't, that would also be interesting because it could be that what they're doing is picking up all these cues that, that, that you're talking about, little traces in the, in the, in the soil and, and um, traces in the vegetation and things, 
but they might not even realize that's what they're doing. Like subconscious clues, yes. yeah. Um, and uh, th that's probably um, what water diviners are doing. And every test that's ever been done on dowsing, where it's been a double-blind trial, has, has shown that they actually are, can't do it. I mean, that when you really do a proper double-blind test, dowsing does not work. Yet, uh, when people are actually looking for, for water under non-controlled conditions, there's some indication that perhaps they are good at it, and they're probably picking up all sorts of unconscious cues mm -hmm. about, I mean, real cues of what's going on right. under, under the ground, um, and, and the vegetation and so, so on. But they also feel that they're doing it by a different, by a different uh, method. Right. And uh, when people, blind people, um, find their way around by echolocation, which is what bats do in, to a very high degree, as you know, and whales do, to, tooth whales do. Um, blind people who do this call it facial vision, and they feel, it's almost as though they're, they're feeling what, they're, what their brain is, t is telling them is going on. They don't realize that they're doing it by echoes. Uh, it, it sort of impinges on the brain through a different medium, which they call not, not all of them, but some of them call facial vision. All right, so their brain is basically rewiring to, to use those inputs and creating a, exactly. a, a and model. Yes, and, yeah. and I've, I, have, I have speculated, and I'm still quite interested in the idea, but it's untestable, that w when bats and dolphins are using echolocation, and they're using it to, do, uh, to, to navigate and to catch prey and things as if they had vision, um, I, my speculation is that the way that the brain processes it may be very similar to the way our brain processes vision. And so the question, what is it like to be a bat? It could be that it's not all that different from what it's like to be a visual animal because the, the detail of the information which is being processed is such that it would make sense to model it in the brain. I mean, what, what, what we see when we look around us is a kind of model of the world which the brain constructs based upon vision. It's a virtual reality It's a virtual reality model going on in the brain which is being updated by the eyes. Could it be that there's a very similar virtual reality model going on in the bat's brain that's being updated by the ears? And it might feel to a bat very much the same. Even, I've speculated rather <laughs> too daringly perhaps, they might even hear in colour. Because, because color labels, I mean the sensation of redness, the sensation of blueness, are constructed by the brain as labels, in our case, for, for light of different wavelengths. In a bat's brain, you could use the very same labels, because they're just knocking around not doing anything, use the very same labels uh, for texture of, of the surface of, of the um, the surface that their that their echo their echoes are bouncing bouncing off. So it's like they're feeling it almost through yes. the senses or, of their. And it might even be that they use they use red to code shiny hard surfaces and blue to code soft furry so surfaces like a moth. Right. And that's of course total speculation, and I think it really is untestable, but it sort of makes sense. And it and it is like just like you say in your book, though it, it is a magic and it is a wondrous thing. I. I don't understand why people find that less amazing than, uh, than just magic. Yes, well, you're probably referring to The Magic of Reality, my, yes, the, my exactly. latest book, which is for, for young people. Yes, when you, when you actually stop and think about what's going on in the real world, uh, and perhaps the most magical thing of all is that we have evolved to the point where we can appreciate it and understand it, uh, and that is magic but in a, in a really good sense, not in the sense of magic spells or, or Jesus walking on water and that kind of thing. I know that you grew up in Africa, and my wife and I, with our jobs as painters, we travel a great deal to uh, traditional cultures and tribes, and we run into a, a lot of missionaries um, in these places. And one thing that I have found is it almost seems that they come in and some of their success, a lot of their success, is the fact that they come in and they bring in technologies like, like water and electricity and teaching people different, uh, uh, more modern ways of farming or these sorts of things. And they're almost using that to say, hey, look at what our God has created. And so, you know, you can get these technologies. And it, the conversion to religion, are they using that almost 
uh, taking credit for that when they really shouldn't be. That is so irritating, and I think it's happened uh, ever since missionaries first started going to such places. Um, they are hijacking the technology, which has nothing to do with religion, but because they are the ones who first bring that technology to these places, uh, they get the credit for telescopes, guns, um, for just the, all the, the wonders of Western technology. Uh, and the, the tribes that they, that they visit attribute this to their god rather than to their science, which is, which is well, ironic's too, too weak a word. There, there was a recent uh, firestorm uh, over, and I think this has happened many times, I think by people who haven't read your, actually read your book so they would know that this is your position, of you admitting that you can't prove that there isn't a God. And they took, take, take this as if, oh, Richard Dawkins has finally admitted or come around to the, to the idea of God. Uh, why is that a misunderstanding of your position? <laughs> You're right. I mean, clearly they haven't read, read The God Delusion. In, in, in The God Delusion, I lay out a seven-point a seven scale. From one is I'm absolutely certain there is a God. Seven is I'm absolutely certain there is no God. Um, unlike religious people who are perfectly prepared to go to the one extreme and say I'm absolutely certain there's a God, no, no reasonable scientist could actually prove or claim to prove that there is no God. All, all you can do is say there's absolutely not a shred of evidence that there's a God and therefore we are agnostic about not just the Jewish God but all the gods about Thor and Wotan and Jupiter and Zeus and, and Mithras and leprechauns and goblins and hobgoblins and, and every uh, thing that any tribe any, anywhere on earth has, has imagined and plus millions of other things that you could imagine. Yes, you have to be agnostic about just about everything, but uh, the onus is on those who want to believe in a hobgoblin or a leprechaun or in Yahweh uh, or Jesus and when you thrust the onus on them, they've absolutely no evidence whatsoever. It's been convincingly demonstrated that countries where there are high rates of poverty and high rates of economic inequality are the countries with the highest rates of religious belief. Economic welfare and education are the enemies of religion. And this is true, by the way, if you look across the different states within the United States. Low education, high poverty, and high inequality tend to go with religion. You work that out, why that might be. Of people who are religious, the overwhelming majority have the same religion as their parents. What does that tell us? If you had happened to be born in Afghanistan or Pakistan, you would almost certainly be Muslim. If the Taliban fighters had happened to be born here, they would almost certainly be statistically Christian. And how we've been fighting Muslims for <laughs> a thousand years. I mean, it's, it seems ridiculous. We're killing each other's children, and we don't even know why. The two religions can't both be right because they contradict each other. But they could both be wrong. That's right. Make some noise! Greg um, Graffin from Bad Religion was a great interview with him. Uh, and he's a, you know, a, a trained biologist himself. And he, he said that um, he didn't think that Westerners could ever really understand Chinese medicine. And that um, that didn't mean that it wasn't still true and valid, which to me, I, I didn't quite understand. It almost seems like a cultural, uh, political correctness to not want to, uh, um, you know, criticize somebody else's medicine or something. I think that any claimed medical procedure, uh, even if it's not based upon what Westerners think of as medical science, it cannot absolve itself from the need to demonstrate its effectiveness by ideally a double-blind control trial. So if Chinese medicine or homeopathy or, or acupuncture or anything like that can demonstrate its effectiveness in a double-blind trial, then we have to take it seriously. But it's one thing to say that Chinese medicine or any of these other alternative medicines have a, have a different, different 
principles underlying them. They are not allowed to get away with having different principles for testing. Um, there's only one way to test, and that's the objective scientific way to test. And this has been perfected in the double-blind control trial. Um, it's not always possible to do that. It's a little bit hard to know how you would test acupuncture. Um, I mean, it's, it's a little bit hard to do a dummy. A dummy. I suppose you could, you could stick the needle in the wrong place or something as, be, as, the, as the control. Yeah, the control would be um, In the case of homeopathy, it can be tested. Um, I mean, it, it's, it, it's, but when you think about it, it's almost obvious that it can't work because the control dose and the, and the experimental dose will, will both contain nothing. Um, but nevertheless, if they insist on, on there being some memory trace in the water after it's been um, shaken, succussed um, with, the, with the active ingredient, so-called, um, then that is in principle testable. Right. Uh, by a double-blind trial. It's got to be tested properly before we take it seriously. Why do you think there is such a double standard where we are very rigorous and even just average people, uh, even people who are into this sorts of alternative things, they want to know that a drug is tested and if it wasn't properly tested they're going to sue, but then if it is something in the alternative medicine they require no, no, none of that. The world is full of such double standards and you're absolutely right. Um, it sort of works in a funny kind of way because um, people like homeopaths have much more time. I mean, the, what, what they, they're, they're doing absolutely nothing. Um, their, their, their substances don't do anything clearly. Nevertheless, we know that psychosomatic medicine works. Um, we know that people are, um, can be cured by a confident doctor giving comforting words and saying you'll be all right and, and giving a placebo, the placebo effect works. And so um, the double-blind control tests use a placebo to test a, a drug against, and that's what orthodox medicine has to do. Um, homeopathic medicines are nothing but placebos, and we know placebos work. And we also know that um, part of the, the placebo might be just simply sheer time spent with the therapist. And a real doctor is busy, doesn't have the time. And real doctor, you go quickly in, you write a prescription, and, and you're out. But um, a fake doctor, like a homeopath, has time to give the comforting words and so on. And so it, it might actually be um, effective for homeopathic, uh, sorry, for um, placebo reasons. Right. And a doctor, I guess, can't actually say give sugar pills like they used to in, in They used to be allowed yeah. to, give, to give sugar pills, and, uh, but now they're not. It, right. it, it in, it's said to infringe patient rights. Right. And so they, but the homeopaths are allowed to give placebos because they're not called placebos. Um, so <laughs> that's another double standard. Do you really believe that when a priest blesses a wafer, it turns into the body of Christ? Are you seriously telling me you believe that? Are you seriously saying that wine turns into blood? Mock them, ridicule them. In public. Don't fall for the convention that we're all too polite to talk about religion. Religion is not off the table. Religion is not off limits. Religion makes specific claims about the universe which need to be substantiated and need to be challenged and, if necessary, need to be ridiculed with contempt. You are very... Um aggressive, like the speeches you gave at the Reason Rally, of wanting to confront religious um, stories and nonsense. Um, are you really, are you actively trying to convert or destroy people's religious beliefs? Well, first, I, th I think it's important to make a distinction between being aggressive to people and being um, aggressive, if that's the right word, to their beliefs. Uh, I, I think I, I quoted Johan Hari, who said, I have too much respect for you to respect your ridiculous beliefs. Um, on the whole, when I say that sort of thing, I, I say it in a quiet, modulated tone. I don't, I don't shriek like some 
preachers do. So if we're going to use words like strident and aggressive, um, it applies far more to preachers than it does to people like me. Um, am I trying to convert people? I know that there, are, that there are certain people who will not be converted, probably not be converted ever, and even less likely to be converted by shall we say, a, by, by ridicule, which is what I prefer to call what I do ridicule rather than, uh, rather than aggression. Um, so there are many people who will not respond favorably to their beliefs being ridiculed, but I suspect there are even more people who haven't really got very strong beliefs anyway and who kind of sit on the fence without realizing that they are sitting on a fence, who've been perhaps baptized and sort of kind of think of themselves as Christian because their parents thought of themselves as Christian because they were baptized, say, and they haven't really given it very much thought. Um, I suspect that those people might well respond if they see the, the ideas that they don't really hold very dear, but just sort of think they probably do hold, if they see those beliefs being ridiculed. And I certainly remember from my own earlier days uh, responding to reading ridicule of a something that I, that I did believe, but not all that strongly, I, I immediately saw how ridiculous it actually was, and, and that did change my mind. And so I guess that I'm talking to people like that, and I leave it to others to go out to use more seductive techniques um, on the, the real sort of dyed-in-the-wool believers, but I suspect they may not succeed. I mean, we've been trying seductive methods for a long time and they, they don't seem to work very well. Um, there's, I, I get an enormous amount of evidence that, well, my book The God Delusion, for example, has converted huge numbers of people. Again, as again, not, not from deep fundamentalism, probably, but from a, almost sort of un, unconscious fundamentalism. They don't realize that that's what they are. I think a lot of people haven't ever really thought that yes. deeply about yes. what they believe. That's right. I, I know that was my experience. I grew up in Chicago in a working class Catholic neighborhood, mostly immigrants, and um, Catholic, same Catholic grade schools my mother went to, and then Catholic high school with the Jesuits. And in high school, just reading uh, books and history, since I love that so much, I, I very quickly realized this is not true. This yes. was made up. But I was very isolated, and I knew nobody else who did. And um, I think just the fact of me talking too to people, uh, now my father and all my brothers and sisters are atheists as well. Wonderful. I think well that it's easy to just go along yes. unconsciously and once I, you yeah, actually totally read. Totally right, yes. Yeah. And I suppose I did myself. I mean, I, you know, I, I was confirmed in the Anglican Church and, and we didn't really believe it very strongly. I suppose I went briefly through a stage of believing it, but um, I was certainly ripe for losing it. Yeah. And, and a lot of things that I didn't even think about when I was young, my mother only told me this story a couple of years ago, I think because she had a little bit of wine, which she never usually drinks, at a wedding, my sister's wedding. And uh, I had never heard this story, never heard her say anything negative against the Catholic Church, my father either. And when she had my youngest uh, brother, who was, uh, there's four of us, uh, the priest had been called because she had had a rupture when she was giving birth and they thought she was, die she was going to die, and so the priest was called to give last rites. She ended up not dying. And the doctor, though, who was Jewish, told her that she had to have her tubes tied, that if she ever got pregnant again, halfway through, it would absolutely rupture again, and she would definitely die, and then so would the child. And so he left, and uh, she asked the priest, and the priest said, you've just seen a miracle. You were supposed to die, and God saved you. Um, you cannot do that. It's against the church, and if God wants there to be a miracle and you to give birth again, he will heal you. If he doesn't want you to get pregnant, you have to leave it in his hands. And so she said, okay, I guess that's what we have to do. The priest left. And then my father, just she, my mom said, I should never see my father get so angry or had never say anything against the priest. He said, that is the most ridiculous thing I've ever heard in my life. You are having your tubes tied. We're not going to have a family. What, what is this priest thinking of leaving a family of four children with no mother? Um, and so she did, and she never had pregnant again. But uh, uh, it was made me realize, had my father not been there, had they both been as trusting as my mother, uh, I probably would have grown up without a mother. So. That's a shocking story. Yeah. I mean, that, that is truly evil. That priest is evil, uh, not as an individual. He's, he's in, indoctrinated by an evil doctrine. Uh, the Roman Catholic Church, I think, is the second most evil organization in the world. Yeah, 
I mean, it's, it's amazing to me because I know that the priest really believed that. He thought he had been the president of a miracle and really believes in miracles. So he, you know. You've told that story, uh, and it, this is going to be made public. Um, so I guess your mother doesn't mind that story. I asked either. her if it was okay. Yes. And she said she didn't want to tell it, but that she was okay with uh, yes. being told. Yes, yeah. because I do think that's a story that should be very widely propagated. It's, an, it's yeah. yet another example of how wicked the Roman Catholic Church actually is. Well, because people are always saying, well, you know, so what? Why are you so adamant about it? Because it doesn't really do any harm. Religion's good anyways. It gives you morals and this sort of thing. And I have seen a lot of personal examples in my own life and friends of mine, and I have seen true harm that it's caused. That's why I'm doing this, you know, even though this isn't what I normally do. It's really over the years, more and more things have added up to really see how it's harmed people. Yes, it really does. But the other thing is how horribly widespread is the myth that you somehow need religion to get your morals. I mean, if you, you just think for a moment about that. It's obvious non nonsense. You don't get your morals from religion. Uh, well, you better not get them from, you certainly better not get them from the Bible. Heaven forbid you get them from the Bible, or the Quran, even worse. Um, so you don't get them from, from the Bible, and in any case, why would you? I mean, are, are you so devoid of moral sense that you actually have to go and read a book to see that thou shalt not kill? One of the questions I ask people is, would you do what Joshua was ordered to do? Would you kill men, women, and children if God ordered you, or your own son, or own child? And almost everybody, there was one or two that didn't, said that they would, that if God gives an order, you must follow it. Yeah. Joshua did the right thing. But even Hare Krishnas, they have stories like that in their Bible. They said that if Krishna would order it, they would do it. So did Muslims, so did uh, Mormons. Uh, all the different groups had, uh, it wasn't just Christianity. It was fascinating how this blind belief. And you have this on film. Yeah, that was in my first film, yeah. Uh, w yeah. Which, which is called? It's called In God We Trust. We'll give you a, a tape of it. Yeah. In God We Trust. Well, let's give yeah. that lots of publicity because that sounds an yeah. amazing set, yeah. of, set of stories. If you were in Joshua's place or in Abraham's place, Mm -hmm. and God, and you knew this was God, and he ordered you to kill all the men, women, and children of the Canaanites, or yeah. to kill your own uh, child, would you follow that order? You know, I hope I'd have enough faith to, to, to know that that, yeah, to, to follow that. You would, yeah. Uh, and that's a serious, that's a serious thing. That's when you're really putting your faith on the line. <laughs> now, for me, it would be difficult, it, just like it was difficult for Arjuna. It would be difficult for me to go and, and kill all of my friends and my family members and my grandfather and my teachers who are, you know, respectable people, who are, you know, good people. That would be really hard. It's a, it's a, it's a question of, of being actually surrendered. These are people who depart from their innate moral sense and from the universal moral sense of a 20th or 21st century person mm -hmm. because they, they find that in their Bible it says something and then they say, yes, if God ordered me to kill my son, I would do so. Goodness. So if you're at the direct command of God, then that's the end of the story. I traveled the last three days of the world with the May 21st group, Harold Campion's group. Oh, yes. So I traveled in their motorhomes with them for the last three days of the world and filmed them, proselytizing, and yes. things. I came away from it extremely sad and depressed because so many of these people had quit their jobs. For, they'd spent all their money in this effort knowing that this next day would be their last day. I find it very hard to rustle up any sympathy for them, I must say. But I, I, That's I could, how I felt at first. Yes. And then when I met them, though, yes. I, they had brought their children. They're, they're, well, that, you know, that does make me sad. Uh, it was very sad, you know. That does and, make uh, me sad. This teach you about God and the rapture. When God comes, the people who are saved, they're going to go to heaven. The people who aren't raptured, they're going to stay here and suffer the five months of judgment. And probably the idiot who, who led them believed it sincerely. He Do did. Think, yeah. yeah. Harold Camping absolutely did, yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's like the... Uh, you know, it, it, sometimes people are purposefully taken advantage of. When I was in art school, this is like 25 years ago, uh, that was one of the times that it really came home to me because there was a girl who, um, her mother had given all of their savings to Oral Roberts when he did that thing and said he needed oh, some yes. money. She had to leave school because uh, yes. she gave all her money to him. And uh, I was, that is, I think, because I didn't have real bad experiences. I didn't know about my mother's story at that time. I had, I didn't have any bad experiences with the Catholic Church. So I kind of saw it as a little bit of just, 
not really harm anything, kind of a community organization. But when I started to see stories like that, I really realized, wow. Yeah. You know? The gullibility of people is, is, it never ceases to astound me. Yeah. Um, uh, P.T. Barn Barnum, was he the one who said there's one born every minute? Right, um, a sucker born every minute. Sucker yeah. born every minute. And it seems so easy. You've, all you've got to do is set yourself up and call yourself reverend right. and, and then ask, I, I guess you won't, you won't get many people, but you get enough. Um, you say, give me your money. And some people will. And that gives you the money to, um, you know, boost your opportunities to ask yet other people, give me your money, and then you get more. What do you think of the universality of this? I mean, it's so widespread. I mean, is this something that we will ever overcome, or is this just something that is in our, in our mind structure? <sighs> I, don't, I, don't, I just don't understand it. I mean, nobody that I know would be that stupid. Um, so where do these people come from, the ones who will actually hand over their money to an obvious con man, an obvious charlatan? Um, Maybe they're prepared by childhood indoctrination. Um, you, you're taught as a child to believe in the supernatural. I don't know. I, you better strike that. I mean, I, I'm, I'm just it's talking about okay to an say amateur. you don't know. That's one of the things, actually, that I love about your books, where when there are things that you don't know, you say, I don't know. That's not something I come across when I interview the religious. <laughs> no, <I bet. laughs> um, no, but it, it, it is very baffling. I, I can sort of understand childhood indoctrination persuading people that they're going to live after they die and persuading people they better be good or they, they'll go to hell. Even that demands a pretty heavy dose of gullibility. But when it comes to give me all your money, I would have thought that little kind of warning voices inside the head would start saying, wait a minute, he's asking for me for money? Um, huh. Wouldn't you smell a rat? I mean, wouldn't you, wouldn't you think that this, is, this is a con man? Yeah, the people that I've interviewed, uh, Hare Krishnas, Christians, all the different groups, the thing that I found, especially of the people who have converted later in life, um, is this seems to be the deal to me. Is many of them say to me over and over, I've always had all these questions and I didn't understand where, what happens when we die or the universe or how things were, what's the purpose of life. And when I finally came across this one person who was talking to me, he gave me all the answers to all the questions I'd ever had. Yeah. To me, that's the deal. Yes. You don't have to think anymore. Yes. You, everything's laid out for you, so yes. you will give your money yes. to it. It's that peace of mind. Yes. But the thing I only just thought of is that there's a sort of asymmetry. I mean, I'm in the business of asking for money. I, I run a charitable foundation, um, and, and we ask for money. But there is an asymmetry because when you're a religious preacher who's asking for money, your constituency is by definition gullible. And so you can go out and say, give me your money. <laughs> they will, because that's the sort of people they are. But our foundation is trying to foster skepticism and critical thinking. And by definition, skeptical and critical thinking people need, need convincing. And we try to convince them, you know, with, with evidence and things they like that. They want results. Yes. And proof. Uh, that's right. So. Yeah. Um, I hadn't, it hadn't occurred to me that, that there's an asymmetry in how easy it is to, to raise money. One um, example, we, when we were at uh, Justin Griffith, the first time I interviewed him, I'm going down for a month and interviewing him uh, and following this rock band belief. The first interview I had was so funny because as we were starting to get the interview go, there's a knock at the door and Justin's like, oh, all right, well, just a second. We go over, it's a group of five evangelicals uh, that are just going all around the base to convert people. So we got them to agree to be interviewed on camera. So we interviewed Justin having a, a little debate with them about you know, what they believe. And I went to their church. And uh, it was very disturbing because it was a very poor church. And they had a big membership. And the sermon was all about uh, this prosperity doctrine about you. They had examples of people stand up and then there's people on videotape who said, I didn't think I had any money. I had lost all my money. I didn't have anything to pay my rent or this or that. And I was not going to tithe that month. But I decided instead I went to my credit card and I got an advance and I tithed double. And lo and behold, I got a check that I didn't know was coming from a tax return. And this was drummed into them over and over. And uh, it was very disturbing to me. I wanted to stand up and say, no, put your money in the bank instead for a college fund. But they were, they were convincing them very well, and they, 
minister lived very well, and he traveled to Haiti and all these different uh, places. Yeah. And he probably had a private plane and, and, and a Rolls Royce. It was Royce. not that wealthy of a uh, no, church. Many of them are. Oh, yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. And it's tax-free. But it was very disturbing because I really do feel like those people were being taken advantage of, even if the minister doesn't even really realize that he is. Yes. And we, of course, we have examples like Dan Barker. So we know that people, and, and myself growing up in it, people can actually wake up to it. I think you're right. I think the childhood thing plays a yeah. big Well, you know, and we've got this thing called the Clergy Project going, uh, the Richard Dawkins Foundation. Is, right. it, um, and um, there, I think there are something like 150 uh, clergymen and women in this project, in this forum that we've set up, who've lost their faith. They've become atheists, and they're just trying to pluck up the courage to... Um, to come out. It needs a lot of courage because they're going to lose their livelihood and their respect in their local community, maybe their family. It needs a lot of courage to do that. Yeah, we interviewed the two ministers that, that had, had gone through that process at yes, the uh, American good. Atheists. How did you think to do that? Where was the uh, germination for that idea? Well, I've, my, my thought, when I mean, I, several people independently thought of it, and I was one of them, and my, my thought was that we would try to raise money for sort of retraining scholarships. For right. for um, for clergymen who'd lost that uh, clergymen and women who'd lost their faith, um, but and I pretty quickly realised that you'd have to raise a lot of money to do that. Um, so we switched instead to uh, this the clergy project where we set up a website, which does cost quite a bit of money actually, but not as much as paying somebody's salary, um, paying lots of certainly as much as paying one person's salary, but not as much as paying lots of people's salary. Um, but what it is, it's a, it's a forum where they can go and talk to each other, compare notes, cry on each other's shoulders, I suppose, and um, eventually find the security and the courage to come out. Um, th that was m my in, um, origin of the idea. You'd have to talk to the other people who independently thought of the idea for what they... What they we are interviewing uh, yeah. Canada and stuff, yeah. Um, and, and that meant a lot to the ministry. And it might to. come to it. I mean, if, if we do manage to raise more money, then it, we, might be, we might indeed be able to, to retrain, to, to give money to, to, to retrain. We say pay a year's, a year's yeah. salary while they get retrained. That, that would be a possible... That is a hard thing. I mean, yes. where else do you use Bible quoting skills? You know, well, yes. A divinity I mean, degree. They, they might... They've got skills probably with interacting with people. They might retrain as counselors, as teachers, um, maybe as carpenters. You know. <laughs> <laughs> there you go. Yeah, that, that, that's a, it's a fascinating project. One of the things that has happened, uh, most of the um, speakers, even, even a lot of the famous ones, they have all said in their personal story of how wherever they started from, almost all of them have said, that your books, when they came across your books, and this happened to me in high school too when I read uh, The Blind Watchmaker and those sorts of things. It was somebody who's had a lot of doubts and that really crystallized for them a lot of the arguments and a lot of the proofs and really said, you know, had, had a big impact. I mean, I, I think, I don't know if you realize the impact you've had on all of the people. I mean, that must make you feel pretty, pretty good about I do get an inkling of that from letters and from what people say to me when, I don't know, when I meet them in book signing cues and things. Um, my, most of my books have been on evolution and I can see that those books would indeed have an impact on anybody whose, whose belief in God was based upon the argument from design, which I suspect may be a majority. It probably wouldn't have much impact on people whose belief in God was based upon the nutty notion that you need religion in order to be moral, for, for example. You, and, but the God delusion does discuss that. Mm -hmm. So um, the God delusion might have converted some other people who would not have been converted, say, by the blind watchmaker or climbing mountain probably. One of my one of the soldiers I interviewed at Fort Bragg, he uh, he actually was a very um, devout fundamentalist Christian, and, and it was in Afghanistan. There, your book, the God Delusion, was just there in a pile of books that people were. And really? he, he was like very intrigued by the uh, uh, by by that, and so he grabbed it and read it, and that was where his conversion had. I'd, yeah. yeah. Well, what, what yeah. more can I say? Yes. And 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 he said that it didn't. You know, uh, uh, he's still a more good person as 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 we know all of them. You know, are so. Yeah. Well, I mean, we we, we did. I don't know whether whether I told this story in, in your presence or whether you've heard it, but we conducted a poll in Britain 
about um, of of people who ticked the Christian box in the in the British census because we suspected that people were ticking the box labelled Christian for all sorts of reasons that had nothing to do with Christianity, and that of course is their privilege. But it's not the privilege of Christian lobbies to, as it were, hijack those numbers in the census. Right. And so we asked um, in the week after the 2011 census, we asked people. Um, whether they tick the Christian box, and the number who did so has dropped from 72% to 54%, which is encouraging in itself. But then we asked the 54% supplementary questions, uh, which showed that they didn't really, they weren't really Christian in any normal sense of the word. Um, and when we asked them, um, why did you tick the Christian box, the most popular answer was, because I try to be a good person. And that bizarrely seemed to, seemed to them to be a sufficient reason to tick the Christian box. But perhaps even more interestingly, when we asked them, when you have a moral dilemma, when you're facing a, a moral question, decision, do you turn to your religious, to, do you turn to, 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 to religion in order to help you to answer that question? Only 10% of the 54% said yes. And the most popular answer to that question was, I turn to my innate moral sense, which is a phrase you've used several times in this interview. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's fascinating. Uh, when I have interviewed a lot of the uh, religious groups, even the Hare Krishnas and all of them, it, it does seem the one universal tie I've really seen between them is their hatred of atheists. As the religious groups of this world argue with each other, irreligion and atheism is taking over. And we see that in, in pornography, in drug abuse, in broken marriages, we see so many symptoms of godlessness in this world while the so-called religious people fight with each other. This is a problem. Um, the Hare Krishna spoke, a lot of them that I interviewed spoke, said religious people should, should unite because atheism is threatening to take over and immorality and pornography, put them all together. And why, why do you think atheists are hated more it's than... It's bizarre. I mean, it, it, it really is bizarre. You've probably heard um, Julia Sweeney's one-woman monologue yeah. where after she escaped from Catholicism, um, her mother discovered that she'd become an atheist. And her mother phoned up and said, well, I don't mind you not believing in God, but an atheist? <laughs> <laughs> so the, the word itself does seem to, I mean, obviously people don't actually know what it means. Right. But, but certainly... Many of them say it's a religion. I mean, yes. Wh why is it not a religion? Well, various people have said, like, you know, baldness is not a hairstyle and, 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 um, and what, and abstinence is not a sex position. Right. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's a non-belief, so it's, it's, yes. you're leaving it open for anything. You're so. leaving it open, yeah. um, and um, you're saying, where's the evidence? We're in the last times. The last times are not coming. We are in the last times. I mean, it's already started. Oh, that's a good one. I'm a big time end times prophecy student. The end of the world, that is something too that it seems like all the groups that I've interviewed are so excited about. I mean, I'll ask about end times or I'll ask uh, whatever the groups are and they just light up. Oh, I love talking about that, they'll say. Why is That's that such an attraction? Even non-religious people yeah. are now with the Maya calendar. Well, that goes back to the early Christians. And uh, if, if you read the New Testament, realizing that Paul and, and the Acts of the Apostles and all, all, all those parts of the New Testament, it all makes sense when you realize that they thought Jesus was coming back in their lifetime. Right. Uh, and uh, he hasn't come back yet. And uh, but, but that still ex excites people. Um, well, I suppose if you believed that Jesus was coming in glory out of the clouds with the, to the sound of trumpets, you would be excited about it. And as we've seen, people can believe just about anything. I mean, people believe that charlatan who said, he wasn't a charlatan, that idiot um, who said the world was going to end whenever it was, May the something... May 21st. May yeah. the 21st. Um, Why the excitement for it, though? Why are they so... Oh, because they're going to go to heaven and they're going to be able to gloat over, the, over the, all the other people who go to hell. Um, which also has an has a ancient tradition in, in Christianity. One of the church fathers, fathers, I think it was Tertullian, said something like, um, for the satisfaction of the saved, they are permitted to witness the sufferings of the damned. <laughs> right. That's their entertainment. That's their, yeah. their, their uh, MTV, I guess. 
Yeah, and that's, uh, that is funny. I'll, nowadays, I don't know where this came from, but everybody is constantly quoting to me uh, that knows I'm an atheist and are a Christian. They're constantly saying, well, you know, there won't be any atheists in hell. <laughs> I guess meaning once you're in hell, you'll know that there is a God that obviously wants to torture you forever. So. Yes, that's a little bit like, um, <laughs> no, it's not really like, but it reminded me of a quote I read yesterday by somebody called Gregory House, who I later discovered was actually a fic fictional character, but never mind, he did, it, was a, it was a good quote. He's something like, if you could reason with religious people, there wouldn't be any religious people. <laughs> <laughs> That's a very good quote. Uh, there's been a, uh, two sides when we've talked about this with the different speakers that I've, I've interviewed at these events. Um, some feel that we are, fundamentalism is really growing and we are really in danger of um, of, I mean, a lot of them say, even the senators I've interviewed have said that if the um, First Amendment came up for a vote now, it wouldn't pass. I mean, with all the fundamentalism that has infected our, our, our things. So some people feel that it is, we are on a brink of going into almost a dark age and that, but then some people like, uh, like Greg of Bad Religion thinks it's just the last gas of a dying, uh, you know, myth. What an interesting question. Uh, um, I think it's probably true that in the present climate the First Amendment wouldn't pass. I mean, the, the present Congress uh, being dominated as, as it is by, by, I suppose partly by just people who kind of, you know, anything Obama wants we vote down. Um, so I think it's probably right that, 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 that the present Congress would not pass the First Amendment. Um, I, I'm only an outsider. I mean, I, I, I'm a witness to what's going on in the United States from outside, and I visit here quite often, and I look, read the internet. Um, it looks to me as though the country is kind of splitting into two. I mean, that you've, you've got um, the, sort, the sort of benighted, um, ignorant, uh, prejudiced, uh, sort of Tea Party wing, and then on the other hand, you've got um, the educated side of America, which is um, you know, the, the most educated, civilized um, country in the world, if only it wasn't for the other half. Um, so I don't know which side is going to win, but history in general is on our side. If you look in the long, the long sweep of history, uh, you see a, a general trend towards improvement. There's a bit of a sawtooth to it, it's it not absolutely uniform, it goes up and down and, and under George W. Bush, there was a, a, a dip down, uh, but over the time scale of centuries, the trend is in, is in the right direction. Yeah, the thing that uh, worries me the most is uh, I see science creating things like nuclear weapons and maybe eventually biological weapons and things. Uh, <coughs> those seem to be only possible to actually control if, they're, if countries are not fundamentalist religious theocracies and stuff like that. It is a major worry that, that um, when, when atomic weapons were first in, invented, only the most technologically advanced nations were capable of developing them. And as that becomes progressively easier, then they could fall into the hands, and biological weapons could fall into the hands of um, fanatics who, d who actually want to die. Um, so that the normal restraint uh, of blowing up the world uh, is, is, is not there because if they have a sort of apocalyptic theology um, where they positively would welcome the world. I mean, the, the people who are obsessed with the book of Revelation uh, and who see the conflict in Israel as being foretold in the book of Revelation as, as necessary to happen before the final return of Jesus, um, on the one hand, th those people would not have the normal um, deterrence against uh, re releasing a horrible right. apocalypse. They want, a, want an apocalypse. On the other hand, we have people in the Islamic world who, for their own reasons, well, they want to die a martyr's death and go to a martyr's heaven. Um, so the normal deterrent, the normal restraint against unleashing Armageddon uh, doesn't apply to such people. So I, I do think it's a serious possibility. Uh, Martin Rees, the, um, 
then president of the Royal Society and, and um, still Astronomer Royal, um, takes a pessimistic view and thinks that, thinks that we may go extinct in the 21st century uh, because, of, because of some such catastrophe of, a, of a, a weapon of genuine mass destruction falling into the hands of a, of a religious nut who, who, he doesn't put it this way, but, but who, who actively wants to die. It almost is a more extreme example of what we talked about with the missionaries taking the fruits of science and then misusing them for the It's their a very own. good parallel, yes, it is. It's, it's, it's people who themselves wouldn't be capable of, you know, using a chemistry set, but nevertheless they can buy um, uh, unscrupulous scientists. Do you remember 9-11? Remember 9-11? We were so shocked, and, and um, that's my birthday, actually. I was, everybody was so shocked because they saw two monolithic buildings towers in the sky taken down people killed left and right right well that's going to be small potatoes in comparison to what god's going to do you know god's going to he's going to take these buildings and they're going to he's going to crumble them. and that's going to change everything for everybody these people that think they can survive it you are you kidding always look on the bright side of life <laughs> i once wrote a play that was based on that idea of uh you know, the religious using the fruits of reason. And it was a, a based on a um, scientist who invented a uh, basically immortality pill. You were asked that question. So it was yeah. just, it's just this a fanciful story, but he uh, decides to give it for free to the world under the condition that you sign an immortality contract saying that you will forswear superstitious beliefs like okay. religion. Yeah. And uh, the idea was, will people make this deal? And you have to take it every week, so you'll be cut off if you go back to these superstitious beliefs. Saying, why these are these are created by reason and not superstition, and so if you don't reject that, and I don't know why you'd want to take it, if you want to go to heaven anyways. Yes. And uh, so it kind of turned yes. on the head that yes. idea yes. of of the deathbed conversion. So yes. do you really believe in what you've told about heaven or do you, would you rather go with science? Yes. I think it's pretty clear actually many of them don't really believe it. I mean that, 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 that's clear to me from the fact that when they're given a death sentence, say by a doctor, um, they don't jump up in the air and clapping their hands and say, and say oh goody. Um, <laughs> right. I mean that's what all the religious people I've asked that question, would you take such a pill? Yeah. They all say no because I want to go to heaven. But of course they know there's not a pill. Yes. And then if I ask them, well then why did you get your heart surgery or this or that? Yes, you know, yes. They find yes. yeah, reasons. Quite. But yeah. 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 Well, thank yeah. you so much Richard well, Dawkins. thank you. Yeah. yeah. That was, that was fantastic. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, we finished that? We're all done. Yeah. yeah. Um, so it occurs to me that um, so much of, I mean I've learned a lot, I mean so, so much of what we've if, if, you could, if you could experimentally um, educate children in critical thinking mm -hmm. uh, and, and just break the cycle for one generation, uh, religion would be dead. I was never uh, brought up in a religious household. In fact, um, a couple of years ago I wrote a book called Anarchy Evolution and in that book I sort of outlined the two disparate elements of my life. Um, you know, punk rock and academic science, and the interweaving of the two through my own personal evolution. And I point out how my family never um, taught us, my brother and I were never taught the traditional stories of the Bible. So we never had any kind of understanding of the what most kids get brought up in Christian society at least, you know, the story of Jesus and all that stuff. And yet, uh, my parents were, are, you know, they're wonderful people who are, um, uh, have outstanding ethics and uh, great moral values, and that's what got passed along to us. So it was always sort of like, I always took a lot of offense when I heard people talk about this Christian society we lived in, or, you know, the other thing that bugs me a lot are when people talk about Christian values. You know, as if there's something different about their values than someone who's not Christian. It's ridiculous. Uh, the truth is, and the more I study evolution and the more I study sociobiology, the more I recognize that morality and ethics doesn't come from an institution. And it's a boring story, but it's as boring as look to your parents or look to who you were raised by. It is statistically utterly inconceivable that 534 members of co Congress are, are devoutly religious. I mean, they cannot be. Better. We cannot be. Um, 
uh, Congressman Pete Stark is certainly not alone. I think it's true that what you said about how there are many fence sitters who don't realize that they're on the fence or yes. realize that they are but don't say so. Yes. Yeah. Thank you so much, okay. Professor Dawkins. Thank it's you. Been a real pleasure. But don't ever be lazy enough, defeatist enough, cowardly enough to say, I don't understand it, so it must be a miracle. It must be supernatural. God did it. Say instead that it's a puzzle. It's strange. It's a challenge that we should rise to. Whether we rise to the challenge by questioning the truth of the observation or by expanding our science in new and exciting directions, the proper and brave response to any such challenge is to tackle it head on. And until we found a proper answer to the mystery, it's perfectly okay simply to say, this is something we don't yet understand, but we're working on it. It's the only honest thing to do. Miracles, magic, and myths, they can be fun, and I've had fun with them throughout my book. Everybody likes a good story. Myths are fun as long as you don't confuse them with the truth. The real truth has a magic of its own. The truth is more magical in the best and most exciting sense of the word than any myth or made-up <coughs> mystery or miracle. Science has its own magic, the magic of reality. Thank you very much.